Coming up, a presentation on ENVIS, or Near Vertical Incident Skywave Propagation. So please stick around for more. Hi, I'm Michael, KB9VBR, your host for Ham Radio q and I'm on a mission to inspire and educate the amateur radio community, so if this is your first time watching, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Well, a couple months back, I did a video on ENVIS, or Near Vertical Incidence Skywave Propagation. In that video, I gave an introduction to the ENVIS uh, method, and also a real-world demonstration um, with an ENVIS contact. Well, now that video was a precursor for a presentation I was to do at the 2018 uh, Wisconsin Aries Races Conference on portable field operations. So for those people that want more information on ENVIS, like how it works, applications, and uh, types of antennas you can use, I recommend that you uh, check out my presentation that I gave on Saturday, October uh, 13th, 2018. I do have a short question and answer uh, sec session after this presentation, so make sure you stick around to the end. And if you have any questions or comments uh, about ENVIS or near vertical incident skywave propagation, please leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear your questions. More articles and information, of course, can be found on my blog at www.jpol-antenna.com. Otherwise, uh, stick around uh, for the, uh, my presentation on portable field operations. Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Martins, KB9 VBR. I've been to this conference many a year, so it's a pleasure to um, be able to stand up on this stage and uh, speak a little bit. And I know I don't have enough material to probably fill up the entire 45 minutes, but uh, I'm a politician, so I can talk as long as need be. Uh, but um, today we're going to talk about uh, portable field setups. It's um, I know when we talk about uh, you know getting up into the field, doing some portable stuff, this is the first thing people think of: the old um, shack on the hip, and it's probably the, it's probably what you're going to grab when you're going to go out and um, provide communications for the area for the walkathon, for the bike race, et, et cetera, et cetera. And they work they work well for an certain extent. Uh, local communications, you know, there's really not not a whole lot. Um, you know, better, better choice. Uh, next step up from that, uh, we can move up to the VHF, UHF, mobile setup, maybe, you know, battery box, uh, any of any, uh, the number of these go kits here. Um, can give you a little bit more versatility, a little bit more power, but um, really, you know, when I came here today to talk about um, uh, portable field setups, uh, we're gonna go uh, HF. And um, instead of talking to the local repeater, talking around the block, we're gonna, we're gonna Talk around, you know, talk around the state. And uh, the way we do that is, um, talk around the state, is really the choice of antennas that, that we're gonna choose, uh, the, uh, you know, the methods in, in which we're gonna wanna propagate our signal. And we do that with um, NVIS, or Near Vertical Incident Skywave prop Propagation. Um, and just to take a little bit of a poll in the audience here, how many people, Know about Envis? Yeah, yeah, everybody knows about it pretty much. Uh, how many people utilize it on a regular basis? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, how many? And I was going to get to that. How many people have an antenna that's only up a few feet in the air? <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> you know, the, the accidental Envis operator. That's probably all of us um, in, in one one or more points of our life. Um, but basically, what the goal of ENVIS is, is um, a low-mounted antenna uh, and, and a strategic choice of antenna so that you can radiate more of your signal upwards in, instead of outwards. And the reason we want to do that is, is to have that those upwards radiating antennas or cloud burners, as we type, as we call them, is what goes up must come down. So the signal you know, if you send it straight up, it's going to hit the ionosphere and it's going to rain straight back down. And um, ideally, we're going to we're going to propagate our signal for a very limited range, maybe a statewide or a low regional basis, 100 to 300 miles. And um, that's the characteristics that we find in Envis communications. The form of communication uh, for targeting other stations within, say, a 100 to 300 mile circle, and 
everybody has a, you know, in, in with proper endless usage and proper conditions, everybody has an equal chance of getting that deer signal in that 100 to 300 mile zone. It's most, it's most effective on the lower bands, uh, 40, 60, 80 meters. Uh, there again, uh, those bands for daytime communication tend to favor a local or a regional basis. And finally, you know, it's, it, we recognize it as low mounted, uh, horizontally polarized antennas. Uh, dipoles, um, maybe that 102 inch whip that's bent over and tied to the hood of the car. Um, and then also finally, one of the other characteristics with endless style antennas is that high power is usually not necessary. It, it, you don't need an amplifier, you don't need a, um, a monster station. You know, you can get by with say 100 watts, 50, 20, or even, even QRP. Um, so, application, what do we want to use it for? Uh, well, you know, it's the best reason why we're going to, you know, maybe make that transition from um, an integrated system like, uh, like repeaters and portables is that with HF, there's no reliance on, the in, on infrastructure. You are the station, you propagate the signal, you know, the other person receives the signal. There's nothing in, in between to uh, get in the way. Uh, next up, you know, we've got 100 to 300 mile range. We want to be able to cover the entire state of Wisconsin. Um, maybe, maybe get next door in the in Minnesota or Illinois. Uh, and this is a perfect, perfect opportunity for that. And then terrain is not an issue. VHF, UHF, strictly line of sight. You got a hill in the way. That's too bad. Um, well, we can move up to a higher spot. And then now there, now we've got. Um, uh, issues with that, you know, uh, maybe that's not where we need the station to be. If we're stuck in a valley, if we're if we've got a uh, range or, or hills uh, between us, uh, and this is a uh, perfect application to uh, make those hills, make those valleys kind of melt away, and everybody has that that equal opportunity. You find, um, you know, you can do a little bit of reading of some of these um, endurance events, some um, distance events out west, say in a in California and other mountainous regions, they'll use HF, um, 80 meters HF, uh, for their checkpoints to communicate because, well, number one, you know, the stations might be too far apart for reliable uh, VHF communications, and number two, there's mountains in the way. So, uh, and this to the rescue. But, and this is not an antenna, uh, so I don't want, you know, don't kind of uh, get that get that in your mind that, you know, when you think of this your incident vertical skyway propagation, you're thinking only antennas. It's, it's a method of communication, and it really involves three different things. Um, your frequency, you're gonna choose power, and then also the height of your antenna. So with that, um, let's kind of go into the theory. I know a lot of people you know, have experienced it a little bit more, so um, just a bit of the background information to, to kind of uh, refresh, you know, how this thing works and and what it does. Okay, so antennas with a high RF radiation angle, they're going to send their signals. Uh, they're they're, they're going to send the signal straight up, and the RF energy is going to range straight down, uh, reflected back to the target area. Uh, with our little diagram there, you see the envis. It's what it's doing is it's hitting. It, it's it's in the daytime. It's punching through that D layer and it's hitting the F1, F2 layers, or at night, the, um, the single F layer as the sun doesn't um, ceases to charge that level of the ionosphere, and it's gonna bounce back down. If, um, if we were to have our antenna mounted, uh, say a, a dipole antenna mounted at its ideal height, a quarter to a half wave in the air, our RF radiation takeoff angle is gonna be much lower. Signal's gonna go out, hit that F layer and it's gonna do what it's gonna do or um, skip. So 20 meters, you know, we got that 1200 mile skip. Uh, 40 meters, we got that 400, 600 mile skip. It's great, you know, we wanna talk to the coast, we wanna talk to Europe, so we wanna optimize for that. But um, if we wanna talk next door or we wanna talk um, next county over with HF, uh, we're gonna want our antenna lowered um, Brought down much lower so we can send that signal straight up and back down again. And then finally, uh, frequency propagation. So, um, 
we know we know uh, um, kind of with our antenna height and where where it needs to be. We know um, uh, you know we, we might pick a certain frequency to use, but um, or, or, or what we may want to do is we want to pick a certain frequency to use. So we need so for proper application of Envis, we're going to need to know our critical frequency or our maximum usable frequency depending on propagations. So the critical maximum usable frequency is the highest frequency that the ionosphere is going to reflect back to us vertically. And that might, and that MUF or critical frequency might be different for, for NVIS than it is for DX communications. And really, our, our MUF is also dependent upon our latitude and the solar conditions. As we move up to a higher latitude, our um, maximum usable frequency is going to look is, is going to drop down. So, say, as, as if we're down in the um, in the tropics, uh, the Caribbean area, at a much lower latitude, then you may find that um, the 20 meter band is actually an ideal emphasis frequency. Yet if we move up here into the great great white north, now you're talking 40 and then 80 meters as ideal frequencies for uh, MVIS. But So generally in, in our neck of the woods, 40 is best for daytime communications, 80 is great for night. And um, there's some resources online you can find this, uh, uh, find what your best maximum usable frequency is for any given point in time. The guy at uh, spacew.com, he's got a great little propagation program you can purchase um, as a public service. To get people, I think he does this to get people to his website. Of course, he's got this little um, real-time map for um, endless of uh, propagation. So if you follow the lines, you can even see them here. Um, nine megahertz. You know, this is it's, it's calculating maximum usable frequency. Nine megahertz, eleven meg, uh, uh, four megahertz, up, up, up. So as you um, go up, and those lines are going to shift depending on the solar conditions. I think when I took that screenshot, it was pretty early in the morning. You can kind of see where the where the sun was. You can see where the sun is. The sun is kind of located there. So that map will change depending on solar conditions, what, you know, what the sun's doing, time of day, etc. But that gives you an idea of what you should expect for a good maximum usable frequency. Power. Endless propagation, you know, it, it improves. What, what it does is when you're, when you're using an endless style antenna, is you're gonna, you're, you're not necessarily using a lot of gain in your antenna, um, but you're increasing the signal to noise ratio by eliminating that um, you know the signal that's going off off to the sides, off those off those loads to the side. So that that noise is is minimized, um, and you get a, you get a stronger signal from you know uh, the, the noise that or the noise or signal that's coming you know coming back straight down. Um, and it has a low path loss, so uh, it's a great it's a great application for low power transmitters. You can use it for QRP operation. Um, you don't need to use, you know, 50 watts. This works just as well as 100 watts with um, Envis. So if you're on battery operation, you can conserve your battery life by picking a low power, um, uh, low power transmitter, uh, transmit uh, power. Uh, you can um, use it. Works great for phone data and CW. Say if you wanted to use one of these data modes that are full duty cycle, like um, RTTY. Uh, you can crank your transmitter all the way down to maybe 10 or 20 watts and um, and have um, very acceptable results. So you can keep your you can keep your power level down, uh, conserve uh, conserve your energy with, with uh, this style of propagation. Height. Now, as as um, as I've mentioned through the presentation, antenna height is critical for this. For DX, we want our antennas up, quarter wave. Half wave uh, to get those those lobes off the side uh, to fire off and, and hit the skip zone. Um, if we want to get that signal to go up where it's so, we're going to want to lower our antennas. So 0.1 up to a quarter a quarter wave, 0.25 away wave and a quarter wavelength are optimum. Um, ideal height 40 meters is going to be about 15 feet. 
And that's a nice thing too, if you're setting up your own antenna, you don't have to get it up that far. Um, you know, maybe a fiberglass painter's pole, uh, maybe that tripod over there uh, that um, that Pat has, you know, that's that's perfect uh, as, as a center as a center support. 80 meters, you're going to be up a little bit higher, maybe about 20, 25 feet. So the low elevation will drop the radiation, but also the low uh, elevation is going to drop that radiation resistance of the antenna. So consider this: if you're going to if you're going to use um, in this propagation, you may not be able to, um, you may or may not be able to use the built-in tuner in your HF rig. So a manual tuner may off may be um, have to be part of your part of your build kit. The antennas horizontally polarized, of course. Uh, so dipole antennas work great. All the dipole antennas, uh, whip antennas that are horizontally up polarized. I've seen here on the the buddy pole. Is a great portable antenna that you can use in an endless configuration. Uh, ground wires or counterpoises uh, work great for endless. If you're using, you know, say like a like a, a whip style antenna, you're going to want a counterpoise uh, to go along with it. Uh, you can run a, um, you know, you want a good grounding, of course. Uh, you can run a counterpoise underneath your uh, dipole antenna. In, in researching this, um, uh, this this propagation method, I, I put a video out on my YouTube channel back last summer, and I had somebody comment on it. He was, um, I think he was from Norway, but it was uh, was uh, was in the military, was stationed in Afghanistan, and he made the comment that well, we were, we used um, Endus, uh, the Endus method all the time out in the field to communicate to base. And, but the ground conditions were so terrible, the soil had absolutely no ground conductivity at all, that um, they almost had, you know, the, the, the earth ground was several feet below ground. So they, they would have to screen counterpoises underneath their, their uh, endless or dipole antennas in order to get enough ground conductivity to get a good signal out of, out of the antenna. So, um, if you're not if if you're if you are you are not getting you know if the signal's not getting out, you won't have that you know, the, the radiation that you're you're looking for, adding a counterpoise might be just enough to um, boost that endless potential. And then also, you know, your antennas are gonna to want to be able to operate on the on the desired frequencies. So um, antennas cut for either you know the dipole cut for a particular frequency. Uh, what I like to use is a 40 meter dipole and I found that I could use it, you know work it with a tuner to get down to the um, 75 meter band and works well enough. So like I said, you know, dipole antennas, uh, 40 meters. Uh, inverted Vs, if you're looking at an inverted V style antenna, um, try to keep the angle very sloping, 120 degrees or more. Um, you don't want a real sharp, sharp V, you want sort of something more sloping. The, as I said, you know, the, the peak of the antenna should only be up 15 feet or so. And then the ends can be down about six or seven feet. Um, easy for one person to put up. Uh, mobile whips, we've talked about. And then finally, uh, just one, one type of antenna I want to kind of point out here. Uh, this is uh, a very familiar style of endless antenna if you've, if you've um, worked in the, in the military at all. But that would be the AS2259 stroke by GR. A style antenna, and what that is, it's a military endless antenna manufactured by Harris Collins. You can find them surplus on eBay and, and other places. Uh, the surplus ones are probably going to be the heck though. Uh, but they're designed for um, mili military style radios, so they are, you know, the wires are kind of cut for the military frequencies. But the military frequencies, you know, they kind of. Um, sit around the edge of the 40 meter band, the 80 meter band. So it works well enough with the tuner uh, for our purposes. But what, what it is, is it's two dipole antennas, uh, sort of crossed in a uh, configuration where one, one dipole is cut, shortened, cut and shortened for the 40 meter band, and the other one is cut and shortened for the 80 meter band, or thereabouts, you know, 6.8 or 10 megahertz, yes, for, the, for the military version. Um, I did a quick search on eBay. There are a few of those online. I know you can find them in some surplus, you know, some online surplus shops too. Um, and they do work well for 
for the amateur radio purposes. But um, you can build your own easy enough and have the, the elements cut so that they're, they function better on the uh, non RHF bands. Uh, found some plans online. Um, Ohio, um, Aries Racies, I think, had it there. If you can, if you can read the, what's on the slide there, had a real nice step-by-step um, -step, um, plans to, to build the antenna. You can get all the parts you need. Um, they had, actually had a parts list from DX Engineering. That's how complete those instructions were. Um, but basically, uh, one set of elements, 25 feet um, for each segment, and then another one, and that would be your 40-meter um, band. And then another set of elements, 38 feet each. That would be for 75, 80 meters. Um, and just a little bit of little bit of rope, so you can tie them off at about that six foot height. Um, T connector at the top, so that uh, can you know, connect everything back together. And um, about a 15 foot fiberglass painter's pole, and uh, external tuner, and away you go. Good, good weekend project. So what I did is, um, as, a, as a practical demonstration of, of, of Envis this last summer, uh, did a little bit of camping and um, uh, put together a schedule with Joe. So, Joe's still here? Yeah, there he is. Yep. Didn't know if he snuck out earlier or not. So, um, and a 40 meter, I had a 40 meter dipole antenna. I didn't build the, I didn't build the Envis antenna yet, but um, since I figured, hey, you know, they're, what they're asking for is a 38 foot segment um, for, for the 80 meter band. Well, a 40 meter dipole is roughly 38 feet on its own. So I can use it, I can use it native on 40 meters, keep it low enough, and then also with the tuner, drop it down to 75, 80 meters, and um, sure enough to work. So. Don't, maybe I don't even need that cross cross antenna. Uh, just use just use the 40 meter dipole and the tuner for both. Uh, set my HF transceiver to 50 watts. Only reason I did that is because my battery I brought with was only 16 amp hour. And then of course the external tuner. So um, here I am putting up the antenna. Uh, like I said, I had about a 12 foot painter's pole. Uh, it was we were down in, um, camping down in the Wisconsin Dells, so huh, their campsite was nice and long. Um, fit in the site uh, perfectly. Just tied them off at trees at about, at about a six foot height. Uh, simple HF rig with an external tuner. I was able to, um, Sunday morning, I was able to get on the state Aries Racy's net. Uh, didn't make it into net control, but um, relay heard me just fine. So we were able to make it in the relay, and um, I heard a lot of the other stations on the net. So um, interesting thing is when you're using Envis, or it worked best with them, with um, everybody else, everybody else has to be using that same method of propagation. So if if, if one guy's on Envis and the other guy's on vertical, you'll never you'll never hear each other. But if everybody's on an Envis style antenna, then you know, the chances of everybody hearing each other. Yeah, uh, raises raises tremendously. So you can kind of tell on the net, on the, working on that on the Aries Racy's net, you know, who, which which guys had that had that lower antenna and which guys didn't because their stations actually came in stronger uh, from um, with my compromise antenna uh, than others. But um, uh, that's a little bit of a side point. So, um, but moving on, um, Joe and I set up the schedule. And uh, he was um, basically, I was down in the Dells, he was in northwestern Wisconsin, Webster, 200 so miles, um, 40 meters, and um, we made a contact. S8, 50 watts, uh, real, real low, shorty, 40 meter dipole, it says. I think he used, a, he used a, a 40 meter dipole too at about the same height, and um, he had a nice, Solid 15 minute so with um, no problems hearing each other. We didn't even have to. We didn't even have to show it on the radio to, to get each other. I think we I think we set exchanged two text messages with frequency, and that was it. Um, we were we were communicating. So it works, um, and it's 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 a it's a it's a viable and a valuable uh, method of communication. So, but like I said, it's it's just it's just a, it's just another method, and there are. 
challenges um, and shortcomings uh, a little bit to end this propagation. One, like I said earlier, all parties need to be using an NVIS style antenna for maximum uh, effect. Now they all don't have to be the same type of antenna, you know, like like a like a dipole or whatnot. You know, if one person's got the buddy stick and another person's got the you know fold over whip, you know that's that's going to be good enough. But they have to be they have to be utilizing that NVIS method, you know, in order for all parties to be heard. Uh, you're still going to be prone to the vagaries of propagation. So one nice thing about VHF, UHF communication is it's nice and it's clean and it's pretty immune to the um, to the fickle nature of the sun. HF is not, so you have to you have to kind of be um, cognizant of that. And also, you know, you've got a limited frequency choice. You know, we're on the we're on the lower HF frequencies, 40, 80, uh, 60 meters. Those are the ideal frequencies or in this style of antennas. So, uh, just like I say, in this, you know, it's not a magic bullet. It's not gonna be the perfect choice for every situation, but it's just another tool in our communications arsenal. And with that, do we have any questions? I think we've got tons of time for questions. Yep. Uh, you said, uh, I think that you need a conicoid on a dipole. How do you uh, create a conicoid on a dipole? All right. The, uh, the question is, is is adding a counterpoise to a dipole, and I kind of I kind of glossed over this a little bit, but um, it's actually the counterpoise is if you're using a dipole style antenna, it may not be um, connected to the antenna itself, but it can be a a wire laying on the ground running parallel to the antenna, and what that'll do is it's not necessarily a connected counterpoise. You know, if I was running a vertical <laughs> antenna, I would hold it over, I would certainly use a, a counterpoise. But this but this wire running parallel to the antenna laying on the ground is going <laughs> to increase your ground conductivity. So, yeah. It sort of acts more like a reflector on a uh, Yagi. Correct, yeah. And that's, that's probably a better way to explain it, is it's, like I said, as your conductivity goes up, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you better reflectivity going, going upwards. It would be, it would, well, it would be, a total total length would be a half wave. It would be really the same length as whatever antenna you have up in the air. What were you using for feet length? I was using RG8X. That's 50 feet of 8X is usually what I carry in my portable kit for a cage Any others? Yep. Would the style kind of work well in the Okay, would it work well in a dense suburban area? Good question. You know, I think it would probably work no better or no worse than any other antennas. One advantage, you know, coming up off the top of my head, is that you do have a, um, it does, and this does increase your signal to noise ratio. So if you've got a lot of um, urban noise, that might work well to um, eliminate some of that. I did notice last spring I was um, I live in I live in a I'm not gonna say a dense residential area, but I live in a I live in a what you would consider a typical uh, urban residential area, and um, I had uh, two antennas set up. I think this was around the time of the Wisconsin Peace Party. Um, had a vertical antenna set up in the backyard, and it was. Um, and it was configured vertically. And then I also set up the, the 40 meter dipole in an invis configuration set up about 15 feet. And AB switching between the two, I could, there was a, a lower noise floor on the invis antenna than there was on my on that vertical antenna that, that day. So yeah, it probably would. Yep. I certainly understand the uh, takeoff angle of the high uh, dipole versus the invis for both sides of, of a conversation to be low in order to get that vertical. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about reception on that uh, in this antenna. Okay. In other words, uh, uh, is it going to uh, prefer a vertical 
orientation as well, or is it uh, received more broadly? Um, I think with re reception wise, it's you're gonna you're gonna be in that in sort of that that same boat with with transmitting. Okay. It's you're gonna because the antenna is lower and you're not favoring the, the the sides anymore those those lobes off the side you will not hear those those dx stations um i did with my um, i think I, when i had the antenna up you know um last summer um i did hear stations five six hundred miles away and i was able to work them on 40 meters but um no, I wasn't, you know, when the band started to go along, I did not hear any of that. I didn't hear any of those effects. So it, it pretty much it pretty much stayed where it was at. In the back. Um, I've had my antenna up and it's been about 25 feet. And if I monitor like the uh, Saturn frequencies, uh -huh. um, I'll pick them up from Louisiana or whatever. It really just depends more on uh, conditions. So you, yeah, with your antenna up 25 feet, conditions really make the difference that, uh, when you're, yep. what, what you're going to hear, you know, as, as, as things move further out. So, and I, I would totally agree with that. It's propagation is, <laughs> your propagation is king when it comes to HF communication. All right, oh, wait, any other questions? Yep. You mentioned the angle of our Uh-huh. I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I, you know, one is preferred over the other. I, I think, you know, that it just gives you an option is, you know, you don't have, you don't have to have a flat top, you know, it's, you can, you can slope down, you know, down to about 120 degrees or so. Yeah. That actually, I've seen plans of that of that style antenna, um, both with and without the without the, the coils. So, if you want, if you want, you know, you can add a add a coil to give it a little bit longer electrical length. And I think one of the advantages of that is um, makes tuning a little bit easier because you've got more to work with. Yep.